conventional scholarship does not allow. Slide two, Dr. Siegel, Dr. Dr. Hartwig. So the book, the road course starts with um two uh, with a two part question: How does travel help you understand a work of literature, and how can literature guide you to a deeper understanding of place? And these questions have both practical and pedagogical intent. Um, I don't know if you have the same thing in Germany, but do you hear a lot about the death of the humanities? Yes, no. Um, enrollment is down among history majors, German majors, philosophy, yes. A lot more money goes to STEM or technological programs. This has really reached a crisis point in the United States. And I'm gonna sort of make a controversial claim and say that the problem is that of your professors, that the wounds that the humanities are suffering are self-inflicted by humanities instructors. I can't think of anything less readable than literary criticism. And small wonder we've lost our audience one way to do offer more reader friendly publications is to tell the stories of places that you like to go. So the geographic model gets us around a really kind of tired story of early American literature. The, the way American literature has been taught in the in the past is you start with the pilgrims up in New England, you know, with the gray hats. <laughs> and then you uh, go to the, the American Revolution, three corner hats, flute. Then you go to Edgar Allan Poe, boo! <laughs> and Benjamin Franklin. And then you go to Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau and the transparent eyeball. I am everything I see all. And the problem with this story is that it doesn't really work that there were all kinds of writings up and down the American seaboard and all across the American continent. And also, this is really important in the United States, it's very important that we establish a past as it relates to the living present. I'm looking at many students here and I think you agree. You're probably relieved when you're reading a two or three or 400 year old book and you can relate it to some present day issue when it feels relevant and immediate and concrete. So slide three, the road course takes a, um, takes a geographic approach. So next to the book's table of contents, there is a frontispiece map. That's the United States, of course. The spatial organization repeats basically how I would see how most of us would teach a course in the United States. All right, now I, I'm not, I never stop being your English teacher. And so I'm gonna try and include all the major things that a course in early American literature should include. There should be Native American traditions, Spanish writings of conquest and the failure, Puritanism, the enlightenment, romanticism, Walt Whitman's barbaric yawp. At the same time, this spatial approach by going around with ge different geographic places allows us to break up or dissolve or not adhere to any one single historical narrative. We have lots of different points of entry into the past, but here's the catch. Traveling into literary space is not Simple. You don't just go to Baltimore and find Poe. Traveling into the past is tricky business. And second, you're often going into sensitive landscapes where the wounds of the American past are still open. Things still hurt in a lot of these reasons we come places we come to. So towards that end, the road course opens and closes at the low country of Georgia and South Carolina, starting with the story of the flying African, Google that um, when, you get, when you get home, 
It's really cool at Ebo Landing, I-G-B-O Landing. Fascinating story. And it closes in circular found, it comes back in a circle to the 1867 book, Slave Songs of the United States which is a classic transcription of African-American spirituals done right after the Civil War. The spirituals obviously had been around for centuries, but had never been written down before. And from there, I kind of move all over the country. If you see in the Florida, in the Southeast, La Florida, in the Southeast, I start with chronicles of these guys, um, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca and Alinka Garcilaso de la Vega. Um, Garcilaso wrote the first book by a Native American, Mestizo, about what would become the United States. I uh, go to uh, number three up in the Northeast there. That's Pennsylvania and the walking purchase of 1737 in the long history of land swindles among Europeans ripping off Native Americans. Um, I guess the walking purchase is probably the worst, the most egregious abuse. And we look at Haudenosaunee or Iroquois treaties, which are fascinating readings. Up in the Pacific Northwest in the top left corner, we look at coyote trickster tales and so on through all the different parts of American literature. Now, I'm not suggesting a simple equation between story and place. So this swooping arrow is a case in point. Literature takes us across place. Chapter eight, that, that arrow there, foregrounds the Mexican War of 1846 and 48. It's basically how, what is the Southwestern United States, a third of the United States basically, maybe even more, um, was, was taken from Mexico. And it's largely overshadowed by the Civil War in the United States and absent from almost all literary surveys. And in this chapter, I situate the poet Walt Whitman, who had very hawkish views about American imperialism or expansion, alongside Mesoamerican pictographs, um, particularly the Tierra de la Peregrinación. Let's go to the next one, Dr. Dr. Hartwig. Here is a sample of the Tierra de la Peregrinación. It's the strip of wanderings, which is on display at Mexico City's Museo Nacional de Antropología. And it depicts the exodus of the Aztec Mexica people. Here, their high priest, the one paddling the canoe or kayak, standing in the canoe, all right, seeks counsel with the hummingbird god over in the right, Quetzalcoatli, those little candy canes, those are speech bubbles. And the Quetzalcoatli is telling the Aztec Mexica that they need to migrate from their traditional homeland, which is in the four corners, southwestern area of what is now the United States to Tenochtitlan, which is the heart of Mexico City. Now, chapter eight of the road course describes my own border crossing. It involves a smuggled bottle of mezcal. Would you like to hear about the bottle of mezcal? Um, I'm not gonna tell you, <laughs> but I'll tell you, it's a good story. <laughs> Buy me a drink and I'll tell you. And, and, and I talk about that alongside foundational epics such as the Tierra de la Peregrinación and Whitman's Leaves of Grass, which I talk about as a the response to the invasion of Mexico. The map maker and I went through several drafts or incarnations of the frontispiece. There's a philosopher, Michel de Sarteau, who writes memorably, what the map divides, the story cuts across. What the map divides, the story cuts across. And the multiple points for this chapter are not my only argument or case for mobility. If you notice number seven on the bottom there, that's Haiti to reference John James Audubon, but I also have them up there in Kentucky in the middle of the country. Um, nine up in the top right is Phyllis Wheatley, who is a poet out of Boston, but I happen to be reading her while on a circumpolar flight on the way to China. Again, 
you can't really just say, oh, I'm going to go Baltimore and read Poe. The stories move around a lot more than that. Also, texts carry us from topographical into political statements, into political spaces. So chapter eight closes the link between the Mexican war and Donald J. Trump. Atzlan, you may know, is both the mythic homeland of the Aztec Mexica and a significant touchstone today. Atzlan, where the Aztec Mexica come from, is a space of justice for Chicanos living in the United States, a reminder of the territorial invasion of 1846 and 48, but also a continuing attempt or continuing effort, continuing resolution to reclaim, to erase the border and bring justice to both sides. Literary studies should take us into difficult conversations. This frontispiece map was finished during the last year of the Donald Trump administration, whose famed rallying call, all right, we're going to build a wall and Mexico is going to pay for it. You remember that one? Yeah. <laughs> Stirred patriotic fervor and hostility towards immigrants. It culminated last January with our clownish, if terrifying, coup d'etat attempt. And it continues as states across the nation are enacting, quote, civics legislation, often very conservative political lessons. They're blocking women's reproductive rights, disenfranchising voters. It's a scary time to be in the United States, to be quite frank. The geographic shape of the United States underwrites this dangerous national bellicosity, this warlike sentiment. After the terrorist attacks of World War II, there were details of what is called the logo map of the United States. And these were false shoot to kill terrorist licenses. These special issue stickers set violent action above the rules. No bag limit. That means like you can take as many terrorists, you can kill as many terrorists as you want. Um, tagging not required. You don't have to I'd register with the government all the terrorists that you kill. And not coincidentally, the idea that there were not any rules to your violence paralleled George W. Bush's unwarranted invasion of Iraq. Why did the United States invade Iraq? I don't know, they wanted to. And that exceptionalism is visually upheld by the graphic image, which, as you notice, depicts the United States alone, without any borders, apart from Mexico, Canada, the Caribbean. I think it's an important message, right? Being the United States being the only, we're, we're one of three nations in the world that call football, the game of football, soccer. Yes, and the same thing that the United States thinks of itself as a special place, as a part. Again, this is important in courses in American literature because we really need to peel back to really question, to try and strip away these stories of national origins because my fear is that they're doing a lot of harm to us as a nation. If we're not addressing our difficult past, how are we going to come to grips with our present? So that leads to part two of the little talk, um, this little talk theory. Let's go with number five. All right. And that begins theorizing our ideas of space. How in short is space produced? I want everyone to put on your philosopher cap for a second. How do you, and that to come back to my framing questions. What can literature tell us about a place? And how does travel guide us to a literary work? This guy, Henri Lefebvre, wrote a celebrated book called The Production of Space, which fused together post-structuralism, which was all really about ideas, ideas upon ideas, and Marxist materialized materialism. And that provided a pivot between physical travel and imaginative space. Now, the, there may be a handful of people here who have read Foucault, um, read Lefebvre and 
Go back into your memory bank, Dr. Hartwig. Have you? Yes. All right, at one point. Or maybe you're hearing this idea for the first time. So I'm going to try and explain the trielectric to you in a very basic way. The first thing I want you to think about is space is an historical product. Space is invented. Space is produced. At the most basic level, economics secrete space. The real estate developer colludes with the railroad company to decide where the stops go. You all with me? So if you really want to understand space, follow the money. Space is economic relations down to the brick and mortar. You all with me on this? The second level of space is representations of space. And that is space as it's reinforced or reinvented or created through urban planning in a lot of ways. So the art museum goes here. The garbage dump goes there. In the 1960s and 70s, our interstate system went through largely poor, often African-American neighborhoods. Um, here in the, in the symbolic part of Segan, there is the creation of a Segan-ness. I don't know if that's the right word, but little local identity. And this is done again through urban planning. If you go up to the charming, if you get off at the bus station and walk through what, the new part of town, the shopping district, you cross the Sieg River, correct? Are y'all with me? And you go between a statue on one side of Henner and the other of Friedrich. And that is what's entering or taking you into the symbolic downtown. Then you cross the street, what the Sandstrasse, is that what it would be, the main street? And Red Friedrich tells you to wait and Green Henner tells you to walk. And over time, that I, I think when the pre people put that in, the reason why the city put that in, paid to have that, is it creates affection for the local. And it's creating a local sense of Segan. It's creating a sense of the center. As you get further out of town, they just have traffic lights that don't have that cute little attribute. So they're saying, this is the important part of town. This is the less important part of town. The third layer, layer of space, representational space, is space as it is portrayed in movies, in books, in film, in popular culture. And so here's the thing, in space, you are kind of bouncing around in between that triangle. Dr. Hartwig, can we go to the next one, number six? So it's very, the indeterminacy has allowed this guy, Henri Lefebvre, to be freely adapted. And his trielectic shaped a generation of academic geographers. Most importantly, there was this guy named Edward Salcha, who wrote a book called Third Space, um, Journeys to Los Angeles and Other Real and Imagined Places. And Salcha talked about Henri Lefebvre's production of space as, quote, a musical composition, resistant to closure, nomadic, in short, as something fluid, more like a work of art or a text. And his version of the trielectic goes between the hardscape, which is first space. That's the physical space. That's first space. Second space is the imagined, the space that you carry around in your head. And third space would be the oscillation in between them. So if you watch like, um, a gangster movie that's set in New York City and you travel to New York City, you get out of the bus station, your feet on the ground are first space. In second space, it's holding the gangster movie in your head. Third space is a combination of the two. So you may go to some old school classic Italian restaurant in New York and your head is kind of in between the two. And all of us do that. Now let's go to the last one. Um, next one, slide seven. This nomadic or musical quality that Soha sees in Lefebvre 
comes back to how we write a place-oriented essay or the methodology, which is kind of behind my road course and also the class that I've had the pleasure to teach here. As I've asked students, pick a place and journey into a relevant or related literary text. Or conversely, pick a literary text and use that as your map into the text. So the process is not prescriptive. It's not easy, nor are the results predictable. But this is where the writing part comes in. Narrative scholarship requires lots of revision. You have to write something five, six, 10, 20 different times and keep fooling around with it. But in foregrounding the process of composition, the writing, it works really well for classroom situations. But it also calls for what I think the humanities need to be doing what I think you should be asking your teachers for as students, and what I think instructors should also be doing, which is for heaven's sakes, tell a good story, because isn't that what we're into? Now you may be saying, when do you get my story now, Dr. Halleck? Well, let's go to slide eight, and I'll tell you the story. Isn't that a handsome young man? That's my son. It comes to the photo anchors, chapter four of the road course, which is called Coyote and the Kid. And my child was then nine years old. Uh, my wife, Julie, and I had recently adopted him. He is holding that big rock, which he's gonna throw in the water, right below the Dalles Dam, which is a hydroelectric plant that flooded Celilo Falls on March 10th, 1957. We're right there below Lake Celilo a reservoir that inundated what had been the most productive salmon fishery in the entire Northwest, where natives went for sources of caloric, economic, and cultural power. Can we go to the next, um, next slide? And then Dr. Hartwig, start at my, uh, five, minute 545, if you just sort of press the button. And here is a, here is a quick, quick clip about the flooding and people's responses to, that's great, to Celilo and the flooding of this river where Native Americans had been fishing for millennia. It was one of our clear, cloudless days, and the people were out there to see it. Because I think it, uh, they wanted to see something that was never going to be seen again. My dad was working on the railroad. He took me out of school, brought me in the car over here, and I remember watching the water come up. It was like a bad dream, like, could this really happen, you know? Well, these slides that you see was taken by my Uncle Ray Percy. And he hated to see the falls go down. It would never be seen again, and I think he's the only one that took pictures of it actually going under. It must have been very painful to see, to have that roar drowned out by 
man-made event must have been very painful. I couldn't go to watch the falls being flooded because my grandma didn't want me to see it. All I seen was tears, like they did when it, when it was flooded. I think my tears were just like, like the flood. I cried even though I was little and not knowing much, but when I seen those falls being flooded, my heart broke too, like my grandfather. It really makes me almost tear up. And I look at that thing and the water's coming in there and there she goes. It's over with. Really makes you cry. It's gone. Let's go to the next one, Dr. Hartwick. Thank you. So again, what happened is Native Americans throughout the Pacific Northwest have been fishing for salmon along the Columbia River. On 1957, a dam was built. The salmon were cut off. Really tragic. I can't watch that video without hearing, and I've seen it many times, and I already know the story. And really perpetrated by the U.S. Army Corps of, Army Corps of Engineers. And it it's, makes it even worse for me that it really represents but one single mark in these centuries long attack of Euro-Americans and, and Americans from 1492 to the present on native people. The problem, that's, that's a broad sweep, right? We have three, 400 years attack of, of racism and, and just hostility and colonization. How do you talk about that focus? How do you find a locus or a speaking point for this broader historical landscape. How do you wrap a story around a place like Solalo? So I want you to come back to the story of my kid at the Dalles, where the requisite US American US flag is painted in a permanent wave on a concrete dam. Um, with this chapter, ironically, I did not start out in search of Solalo Falls. My journey began three years later before my wife and I adopted our son on a trip meant we were retracing the 1806 trail of Lewis and Clark. You guys know who Lewis and Clark is? Okay, yeah, next slide. Um, Lewis and Clark, following Lewis and Clark in the United States is a kind of cottage industry. There are guidebooks, luxury tours, wayside markers, the whole shebang. And the standard route goes from east to west from the Missouri River to the sea, following the Corps of Discovery, as they were known, over the Bitterroot Mountains in Montana to the Pacific Ocean. And the trail is iconic. Frontier pioneers anticipate manifest destiny as America, or what we now call the United States, reaches its continental shape. Not surprisingly, however, no one ever goes backwards. The maps and the guidebook make no sense if you follow their 1806 return. And this is actually a shame because there was snow in the mountains that kept Lewis and Clark from returning. And so they had to pay much more attention to the landscape, to the nature, to the people, to the weather, to the flora and the fauna. One place they stopped, but they did not mention, is a rock formation known as the Heart of the Monster. This was a monster that the Native American trickster Coyote killed, ripped out the monster, ripped out the heart. That's his heart. And, he, and Coyote then threw all the parts of the monster's body to form the various peoples of the Pacific Northwest. Now, of course, this is not even mentioned in the Lewis and Clark Journal, even though they were camping there for over a month. Now, what happened is that I was there with, with my wife, Julie, and we were following Lewis and Clark and we came across the coyote, the, the heart of the monster, and we stumbled onto coyote stories and surprise, surprise, the Native American literature gave us a much deeper rapport, a much richer understanding of the landscape. The stories are just better. <laughs> and so travel prompts reading, which prompts even more travel. Um, and we'll go to next next slide. 
with so what I started doing is I started collecting stories of coyotes and I started plugging them onto a map. Unfortunately, my Google map has gone the way of all disappeared passwords. And but I started looking at um, coyote was going there. A great anthology by a guy named Gerald Ram Ramsey. A early 20th century collection called Grandmother, Grandfather, and Old Wolf, edited by Clifford Trafster. A Nimi, a Nimi Poo, um, a Nimi Poo and Yakima text. One, the Yakima is by Virginia Beaver, portrayed, um, photographed there at 90 years old. She received her PhD at 90 from the University of Oregon, and she just celebrated her 100th birthday. And so what I started doing is finding all the references to coyote stories and popping them onto my map. Now, connecting story and place, then I plan a research trip. But there's a difference. The first time that I traveled there, I didn't have a son. The second time, my wife and I adopted a child. And so I had to balance both being a researcher and being a dad. The result is, and the result came into the essay that was from the road course. And what I discovered is that it's not just about land and stories or land environment and the legends. It's also the role of the parent in holding it together. And honestly, I never would have reached that association if I hadn't been traveling with a kid. You with me? Like that experience made it. And I found a story for it, okay? It's the story is actually not just about research, but it's about Vyvanse. Y'all know what Vyvanse is? It's uh, Ritalin. Everyone know what Ritalin is? You take it for ADHD. You know, if you crush up Ritalin, you get a really good high if you don't have ADHD. And so Ritalin prescriptions get stolen all the time, all right? So here's the story how it begins. We flew out west one pill short. My son takes Vyvanse, a time-released amphetamine and controlled substance for ADHD. The week before Thanksgiving, our pediatrician wrote two scripts to last through the year. Then somewhere in the holiday rush, finishing up school, Christmas shopping, people coming and going, the second prescription disappeared. Julie realized we were running out the day we left town. We turned the house upside down, called the doctor's office, searched through the piles of gift receipts, unpaid bills and medical files, but no luck. I had a week long research trip through Oregon and Washington, a working vacation for novice parents. On six of those seven days, the kid would take medication. The seventh, uh-oh, <laughs> we would just have to bear. The nurse advised us to choose an uneventful time to go off meds, keep the rules in place, and soften the consequences. So that's the essay's narrative hook. That's the story, the missing pill. As you read the chapter, you're wondering, what are they going to do when the kid isn't taking his medication, and how are the parents going to wig out? The answer was, by the way, a big old bottle of white wine, but I don't want to get into that. <sighs> the hook also is what role do coyote stories serve? And coyote stories serve a healing function. And coyote is medicine. The stories are not just sites for the literary tourist, the chapter continues. They date back from time immemorial. Early ethnographers first set the dry bones of these tales to paper in the early 20th century and a range of scholarly as well as creative types. Carl Jung, Claude Levi Strauss, Gary Snyder, Joni Mitchell, Mitchell, Peter Blue Cloud have taken a stab at understanding the elusive canid trickster. Academics studying Coyote note his insatiable appetite for sex and food, his lawlessness even as he makes the laws and an emblematic connection to place. Traveling with family, however, revealed still one more side. His stories ground relationships. Coyote marks the boundaries of a community. His antics, not meant to be imitated, speak to the role of individuals within society. The stories reinvent a shared world out of whack. 
Bartolkin, one of the most insightful critics, emphasizes the healing purpose. Coyote stories, quote, reestablish reality and order after a break has taken place through disordered living, through bad thoughts, or through witchcraft. Coyote is medicine. So I use coyote as a figure of medicine to try and heal the fractured relationship that I had with our son, whom my wife and I had just adopted. Let's go to slide 13. And that takes us back to the Dalles. So after a series of interviews, sometimes fruitful, sometimes not, efforts to connect the stories in the land, we get to Salilo. Remember the video that we just saw a second ago. The anthropologist Clifford Trapser provides one of many stories about the trickster coyote who prepares the river for salmon in Coyote Destroys the Dam at Salilo, written down in 1916, but prophetic. We learn how selfish sisters had blocked a salmon run. Coyote prepares to be a baby, and like Moses, he sails down in a basket, and while the sisters are away, he takes out the dams. So I wanna show a video that I made with my son from Salilo Falls. Let me test you out, Dr. Hartley. Okay. The five sisters lived at the Cascades. Come a little closer. The Nichiwana. A little closer. The Nichiwana. The youngest sister was smartest of them all. They had a dam, Salila Falls, in the river, and headed off the salmon from the upper waters. This was bad. Coyote said, this must, not, this must not be done. Fish must be free for all the people. Coyote sat and studied for a long time. He would go and see the five sisters, but if he was a man, they would not have him. So he became a baby. He made himself a baby in the basket. The women went out, gathered roots. Coyote would eat while they were away, and they got very curious. One day, they ran out. Coyote was going to destroy the dam. They ran to the dam, saw Coyote working. They fought with him. With, they fought him with clubs. They struck him on the head. The first wooden hat broke. They struck him again. They struck him again, and they struck him again. And the dam finally broke. The water rushed by, and the fish go upstream in big herds. The Nichiwana is alive with them. Coyote is glad. He yells, "Ha!" The new people will come and all have fish. You cannot keep the salmon this way. Salmon must be free for all. Here we are, Zach, turn around. There, there, there are uh, the fishing platforms not being used at this time of the year. Right here is the Dalles Dam. Underneath that is Salilo Falls. Zach, you wanna talk about how you feel about Salilo Falls? Or... I really feel like destroying the dam. Oh, well. We won't tell anyone that, but maybe we can destroy it in our minds or we can find a way to bring it down, huh? We could probably get some community, uh, get get a community up and see if people will agree. That sounds good. What do you say we head over to Burgerville and grab some lunch? Yep. Well, bye. Let's go to the next one. Let's, we can probably get a community up and see if people will agree. Next slide. Henri Lefebvre would agree. I love that my son said that. I want to be on the record that I am not advocating echo terrorism as much as I kind of wish that damn down. Um, so the thing that I would want to emphasize that I learn even when I watch it now, I wish I smiled more, you know, because I was having this great moment with my kid and I looked too dour, but also the transactional nature of it. I think the story works in the video basically because I cut a deal with my parent, with, with my son. You know, if he went to the dam and helped me make the video, then he got a hamburger and this great berry milkshake at a burger chain called um, called Burgerville. So he got something out of it too. And like, right, when you're a kid and with your parents, you have to have give and take. And I think that is really important for understanding the story, that it's not just about the land 
and the story, but it's about the land and the story as transacted between a father and a son. And that's really important to this literature. So at the end of Coyote and the Kid, I come back to the hook, how we handled the day without medication. And what I'm gonna tell you is the answer is, um, is a big bottle of white wine for my wife, Julie, from Marymount Vitter, um, <laughs> Vineyards. But the real medicine turned out to be coyote. And I closed the essay by talking about how coyote helped create a family. That was our medicine. We thank, we, are, we thank the miracles of modern pharmacology. The pills provide moments of equilibrium, allowing him to be a child and us to be a family. With proper medication, counseling, and time, new bonds can form over old wounds. Slowly, the trust will come. Parents need patience. Kids test boundaries. Coyote marks limits. The stories about him are powerful medicine. If the could Kid pushes me, our family therapist said, then I must be his dad, to remake his world, to shape his mental landscape and rechannel the neural pathways in his brain, we must give from the root. For deep down, I know already, this wild child has, is my son. So I knew lots of things before I traveled out west. I knew there was a connection between land and story. I knew that there was a case of environmental racism that led to the dam being eliminated. But I already knew that before I got on the plane. When I was traveling with the child, when we were a family, I realized that the transaction between the parent and the child are central to this literature. And again, if I didn't go there in this particular experience, I never would have realized that. So next slide, Dr. Hartwig. Scholarly writing about the humanities gets more real, in short, when we allow our personal lives into the field of study. By including our experiences as a parent, as a sibling, even as fanboy, we reach insights that are otherwise lacking. So if you can't use anecdotes or you reject the first person as, as self-indulgent, entire libraries become unreadable. Didn't humanities professors enter this business? Aren't you a student in English or a history class because you want a good story? By using the first person I, we do appropriate. The dangers of white scholarship on indigenous literature are really well established. What qualifies me to tell these stories? Look, the road course served my professional career. Because of this book, I got a promotion and a raise. So I arguably got more from native culture than in return. And they're still closer to home. What business do I have talking about my son's mental health, his medicine, or the pain of his adoption? As the road course, that book inched towards publication, I very carefully shared chapters with my family members. My son, 19 by this time, had full license to redact or kill Coyote and the Kid. That would have, oh, I would have died because it really is the best chapter in the entire book. But I said to him, you don't want this told, you know, that's your decision. Other chapters incriminated family members. I really dealt with some painful issues that I have with my father. And I had to kind of distribute bit by bit. I went to my sister, then my eldest brother, and then, and then the next, as I slowly kind of outed myself <laughs> that I had written this chapter. Also, the peer review was very painful. I, I expected colleagues to, to really challenge me on my sense, on my uses of, on my, on my sense of white privilege, especially when talking about race relations in the South, but I got this really unexpected feminist critique the dreaded reader number two, we call it in academic circles, who cringed at the internal sexism in my narrative frame. And so to these challenges, to the difficulty, the complications, the headaches and the heartaches, I say, yes, writing about culture should not be safe. A shortcoming of literary scholarship is the moral posturing, all right? We all try and pretend we're perfect, 
Why not foreground our uphill learning curve? When we travel, we learn. It's the oldest narrative formula in the book. Purple person goes someplace, person learns something. The journey with a text in the end doesn't look past our own failures. Travel keeps it real. We finish then with a criticism that's more engaging, that's harder to write, that's more painful, that also is more fun. Thank you very much. So I have any questions you wanna ask, you can ask about the Mezcal, you can ask about Celilo 